and welcome to Strangers Stopping Strangers, podcast number 27. Thank you so much for tuning in. A big welcome back to anyone who's returning, and thanks for stopping in to anyone who's new this week. Now, this week's podcast with Wendy Rutland, we just had so much fun making. I had just uh, met Wendy the night before through messaging about being on the podcast, and uh, we started chatting and decided uh, no time like the present. So we really were just getting to know each other as we take the podcast, and we just had so much fun. Uh, Wendy is an amazing woman with, I mean, such a rich tapestry of life and stories, and uh, she picked out a couple that were just real gems to share. It's just so interesting. And the music, really cool, too. Um, she selected some songs that were meaningful to her, songs that she listens to daily. Um, there's a very cool juxtaposition of Viola Lee Blues from Winterland in 1967 uh, to The Ark in Boston in 1969. And just overall, just a very cool podcast. So, so much fun. And uh, this was the last podcast that I recorded on the old computer. I am just digging having a uh, a modern day device to work with. So I'm uh, imagining that the recording, at least on my end, is going to get better and better from here on out. And um, thank you for anyone who's been listening to a little echoes in the background. And uh, I think that we are going to be smooth sailing ahead. So... That is everything. If you have any messages, um, feel free to send a comment. If you'd like to be a guest, uh, we'd love to hear from you. If you want to check out some back archives, the website's www.strangerstoppingstrangers.com. And uh, as always, thanks for listening and catch you next week. Wendy, thank you for joining Stranger Stopping Strangers. Oh, my God, such a pleasure and an honor. Well, thank you for having me. This is so exciting because, I mean, you, we, we are like women who are, are on the hustle because we connected yesterday and we're taping it today, and I absolutely love that. No, yeah. no wasted time. Let's uh, live in the moment, and uh, that's so cool. And, of course, you know, a big shout-out to the Wall Street Dead Ahead organization, my friends and family, and Deb Solomon, my girl. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah. Hey, Deb. Two podcasts in a row. What's up, girl? Hey, Jill. <laughs> Thanks well, for and, connecting us. Oh, my evening companion as of a couple of weeks ago. Yep. Fantastic. Well, so much fun. Well, you, I mean, I'm so excited to talk to you because your stories are so, so vast. And so, I mean, you, we, we could do nine podcasts. So we're going to do the first of the series of podcasts, uh, starting with this one, because there's no way we're going to get it all in, in, uh, in one. I'm going to try and condense, but I'm jacked up on coffee. So I'm going to do the best I can. Very, very good. Well, so we usually start at the beginning. So give me a little, a little background on, uh, you know, what, uh, what, what sucked you in? What, what, what was the, the, the beginning that, uh, that, that jumped you on the bus? Well, I was definitely not a willing uh, subscriber to the dead. I was totally uninterested. I mean, you know, when I was 11 years old, I decided I was going to change my last name to Morrison. I was all about the doors. Pink Floyd, just everything but the dead. And I had a babysitter that was really into the dead, and she kept trying, but it wasn't working. So she actually took me to the Radio City show, which was completely lost on me. I'm pretty sure I knew one tune. Um, so I, I had that, and I left that show thinking, yeah, interesting. Okay, it was a free ticket, but, you know, and I was still quite young, but it didn't resonate. It really started to resonate um, kind of like quite a few years later. I think early, maybe around 16, 17, I started to be a bit more receptive because I had had a mohawk. I was an angry punk rocker but retained my classic rock roots. Finally, I started to get into it in Boston, and, um, you know, then I went full-on crazy and just hit the road. And I think it was uh, maybe five nights or something like that in Greensboro, and that was it. I was I was done. That was I, it. It was on. Stop wearing shoes. Stop wearing a bra. All those really happening things. And um, you know, it it was awesome. Those were the best days ever. Uh, all the you things know, that and, made your mom proud to go shopping with you, I'm sure. Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, 
Yeah, it, it was real special times, but I became like a real anorak about the Grateful Dead. I thought I needed to know everything. There was a lot of, I always, I, I feel like I'm a bit of an encyclopedia when it comes to music, and I needed to know everything, and there was a lot to know. And I had always read any, you know, or any, uh, you know, electric Kool-Aid acid tests, and I love my rock books. So there was always kind of passing moments of the Grateful Dead, but, you know, now it was a full-blown obsession. Oh. And it became pretty serious. Oh, and it's such a rich story, you know. I mean, they just, they were so at the beginning of so many different things. I mean, um, you know, you and I spoke earlier, and, and being from California and being the Bay Area, I mean, it's just, you know, it was a house band. And I don't even think you realize what's special until later on when you, you know, I mean, perspective is everything. And, uh, and there was so much that was happening at the time when you read back that was integral to, you know, all of that great well, music you, that came out from that time. You got to give props to Keezy and Cassidy for sure. And, you know, I've read a few books on Cassidy, and Cassidy's wife wrote a great book as well. And it just so instrumental. And even Bobby himself, you know, he was so close with Neil. But that those those acid tests were spectacular. And many years ago when I was living in London, I had reached out to Zane Keezy about kind of doing some distribution deal for some of the videos they had. And he just sent me a ton of stuff, you know, for my own enjoyment. And they were incredible things. And they all had hand-painted art covers, you know, painted by Ken. So I, I used to kind of run with that and used to want to kind of create my own acid tests. And I used to spend summers working in fishing canneries in Alaska, and I would put on these very hardcore Grateful Dead acid tests. And, yeah, we'd all be tripping out in the woods in the middle of these tiny islands in Alaska, you know, after pulling fish guts for 18 hours a day. And, you know, I would create these massive Grateful Dead set lists, and we would have our own thing going. And that was all down to, you know, what was going on in, 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 with the pranksters and everything. I used to think that that was just phenomenal and would have done anything to have been to one of those. Oh, absolutely. No, I absolutely feel like I was born in the wrong era. I mean, but, I mean, just your fish story alone, I mean, that's... <laughs> You have some, you have some, uh, you got some, some pretty killer shit in your archives. So I mean, oh. that's nothing to sneeze at over here at all. No, it, it definitely goes deep. And you know, I know you just said fish, meaning F fish. F I S H. Yeah. Yeah. Like, Alaskan. You know, fish. I used to see that. I, I don't. To this day, I don't get the correlation between fish and the Grateful Dead. When I lived in Boston in the old days, fish used to play little tiny shithole bars, and they would play ZZ Top and Led Zeppelin covers. That was fucking awesome. That was awesome. And then, of course, I, I, like, would move, I lived in Amherst, Massachusetts, and we'd go tripping up to, like, Hampshire College, and they'd be playing. But then I moved away. I moved to England for 20 years, and suddenly, you know, Jerry dies, and I'm all alone in England. I can't grieve. And five minutes later, Fish is like playing stadiums, and I couldn't understand it. I didn't get it, and I've never seen Fish again. I don't think I've seen Fish since 1993. You know, the last time I saw Trey was at Fair Thee Well, and I give him props. I thought he did a hell of a good job, and those are hard shoes to fill. But I just don't get the Fish thing. I don't get it. You know, I don't either, but I want to get it. You know, I actually have uh, somebody sent me a Spotify list, and I, I started like poking around with it a little bit. But and I and I hope I get it one day. As far as just even getting to know the catalog, I'm always open to, to new things and new awesome. music. But you see, you got it. Went back in that day when they used to play just colleges, or I went to a couple of house parties in Vermont. I, I felt like I was up for three days, and they were just never. They never got off. They were just always playing. That was awesome. First two albums, great. I don't know from anything anymore. You know, I just stick with what I know. Well, that's it. I stick, I stick with what I know. My catalog is so deep. And, I mean, I love music, you know, outside of the Grateful Dead. And this podcast is, like, dead-related and dead-inspired. And, and even the new bands, you know, that we talked briefly about that are coming out. And, I mean, I just love that. I love, I love that these bands are coming out and doing interpretations of things. Things like Joe Russo or I saw Stu Allen play over New Year's. And I think, like, this is kind of cool. This is something I've been thinking about and haven't talked about in the podcast is, you know, when I have friends that are 
at all into the music and they'll say, oh, oh, it's another dead cover band. And I started really thinking about the meaning of covers and cover bands. And then I started listening to some of Jerry Garcia's albums, like some of his best stuff. And I mean, honestly, so much of it was covers. And it makes you wonder, there's no shame in that game. I mean, really great music was written in so many different eras. And I mean, even classical music, you know, when a great piece of music is written, other people play it and interpret it and bring it alive, then then it's current. It's you know what I mean? Like that's uh so I'm just excited about all the things that will come out and I don't I don't like to limit it by that because there's so many amazing musicians and there's no shame in playing amazing music that's been written, whether it was by Bob Dylan or by, you know, John Lennon or by Robert Hunter or by John Barlow. Like it's all great shit. Well, I can't agree with you anymore. I mean, you know, a big define between covers and a cover band and a tribute band, but I go see tribute bands as much as possible, especially like a Pink Floyd. I go see the, there's a band called the Australian Pink Floyd. I've been seeing Pink Floyd since 1987. And, um, you know, I will go see any cover band because I'm not going to see my Pink Floyd anymore. And, and if they're going to throw in, you know, the first three albums and, and put in a big old light show, I'm down with that. It's the same thing with the dead. I will go see any cover band um, because I need that fix, you know, and, and I've seen them all. But I love bands that do classic cover tunes as well, you know. I yeah, mean, there's mix it up, like yeah. all of the good shit. Yeah, because maybe some of the best music's just already been written, and that's what I want to yeah. hear. <laughs> I mean, like, until you start writing stuff that competes with this, I want to just keep hearing your rendition of what was made, you know. And uh, no, I totally agree with that. Well, so I want to tell the listeners. So we, you, we, this kind of we pulled a rabbit out of our house with this and you picked out just some songs that are like really meaningful and, and integral to your experience but they're not going to be songs that are going to be segueing with your experiences so well aside from the the uh egypt selection because i was living in egypt and had my own uh tribute to the band uh in front of the pyramids with again my own special set list um, so, you know, that, that was the, uh, Terrapin moment for sure. You know, I, I, I would have sacrificed a pinky to have been a, <laughs> that would have been the one, yeah. you know, you don't actually need a pinky. So I think it, you, you could, or, you know, the pinky finger or the little toe that could have gone. I would have had no problem for that to have been to those Egypt shows. Cause Egypt was the greatest place I've ever lived in my whole life. Okay, and it's uh, criminal that most Americans won't probably ever want to go there or feel safe enough to go there. But I lived there a while, and, uh, you know, I can only imagine what was going down when they played those those shows there. Uh, I, uh, I, I, I love, I, I listen to them in my, in, in my list that comes through. Well, let's, well, let's start with that then, because again, we're going to, we're going to pick up some songs, and I guess I want to always have a mix of, of talking and music so we can chat, and then everyone can hear some great music and come back. So let's start with that, and then we have a few other just, you know, special songs that we, uh, that we pulled out that we wanted to share today. So, so you t- tell us a little bit more, and then we're going to go into the Terrapin and, uh, and, and this selection. Yeah, I mean, I just, um, I used to go make my money in the fishing canneries, and then uh, one year I decided I was just getting out of town, and I traveled uh, pretty extensively uh, with like I like $50 in my pocket, so it was a very cheap, uh, very rough experience, but I ended up um, making it all the way down to Egypt, and I just kind of never left, and um You know, it was really important for me to get to Pyramids, which is basically a slum. It's treated, the whole area is filthy, it's treated appallingly, but I had my own spiritual moment, and, you know, I played the entire Egypt set, I was, you know, I was having an enhanced moment, so to speak, and, you know, but Terrapin can stop me in my tracks every single time. When I hear that, I lose my mind, and it's, it's very emotional. You know, I have a lot of peaks and valleys with a lot of different Grateful Dead songs. There's some I will tolerate. There's some I will just start sweating and and, then losing my mind to. And then there's some that just stop me in my tracks and I I can't move. And it evokes tremendous emotion. And when I hear Jerry, I just, 
you know, it's big. Yeah. No, I uh, I I love Terrapin, and and every day I uh, every day I send out a little tweet to this little community that I've uh, gotten to know. And every Tuesday I do the Terrapin Tuesday tweet. So every and so then all every Tuesday I have to tune in and listen to Terrapin because after I send it out, I'll be like humming it, you know. <laughs> until I like pick the song and get the fix for which one that I'm listening to and uh, I mean inspiration moved me brightly I mean it's everything I mean just that that one that one line is uh, chill is, inducing is, is a good phrase it is. it's goosebumps it, it you know and uh, life and when he's on when he was on god damn he was on you know and there's probably no better way to sum it up when that guy was on there was just nothing in his way Oh, absolutely. Well, let's listen to this. So I am going to roll into Terrapin Station, and this is from Grateful Dead Live at Sphinx Theater, and this was on the 15th of September in 1978. And uh, as I do, I'm going to do with these, I'm going to play a nice, sizable chunk of it, and then the uh, in the sequence that we play it here on the podcast, I will have the full version on the companion-only listening. So... Uh, so let's uh, let's get let's get to that first nice chunk of it, and then uh, we'll come back and hear some more stories and play some more tunes. Cool. Takes a fan and throws in the lion's den.
that's how it stands today Who decided he was wise Job is to shed light.
Egypt, and uh, and we, uh, yeah, back from Egypt, and we are just chatting, chatting, so I wanted to uh, welcome the listeners back, and uh, we were talking a bit about uh, Viola Lee, so um, you picked a couple of these, uh, so let's, uh, let's talk yeah. about Yeah. I, I, it's it's so, you know, it's like everyone's talking about Meryl Streep at the moment, and she was in a movie called Sophie's Choice. Choosing Grateful Dead songs is, uh, you know, it, it's like a, it's a Sophie's Choice. But I chose Viola Lee, and I chose two versions, because one is so different than the other. Um, you know, I chose the uh, April 21st, 1969, from The Ark in Boston, um, because... It's filthy. And when I say filthy, I say that in a positive way. It's just dirty and rough, and it's got all that blues happening, and it's a bit slower. And, you know, sometimes when they slowed it down, you know, even like a cold rain and snow, the whole dynamic of the song just changes so dramatically when they get that blues thing going, which I adore. But on the flip side... I went with a March 18th, 1967 at Winterland with that Hammond organ just being beaten and it's so out front and it's so jingle jangle and it's at a big fat speed and it just goes on forever. And, you know, I mentioned this to you earlier. The only problem with it is that it ends. I would like it to go on forever and ever. And it's just so tight. And I can imagine what that crowd was feeling in 1967 to have experienced that live would have just been spectacular. I mean, it's just a game changer. To me, that's, it's, the, it's the beginning of a new kind of phenomenon because that just did not exist. It just didn't, you know. And this, I'm into all kind of garage, psychedelia, and all those kind of, uh, you know, the Nuggets box sets and everything that Rhino used to release. But there's nothing to compare what the Grateful Dead was doing back then. They were on fire, and so much of that has to do with Pigpen, who never gets enough props or ultimate recognition, but they were on fire. And I I like the choral, you know, there's little correlation between the two of these tracks, even though it's the same song. It's just such vibe. And, uh, you know, I could just listen, I could listen to both of them all the time, and, and I frequently do. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to play them, and uh, I'm going to play one, and I'm going to fade out, and then I'm going to fade into the other. So I'm going to I'm going to do I, I don't know yet I don't you know four five six minutes. I think they're both about they're, actually they're both thirteen minutes, um, thirteen yeah. minutes and change. So I'm going to um, do we're going to go into about ten minutes of it. I'll do about five and five, and uh, and I'll make sure when I uh, when I put this music in that it's going to like go fully faded out and then fade back in so that there's a divide between the two and this is going to be really fun to listen to so um so we can kind of get the juxtaposition of it and then kind of as with the terrapin we're going to have the full songs back to back and then people can just loop them just loop them and loop them and listen to them um so that sounds that sounds like a plan awesome sounds all right very cool all right. Well, let's uh, let's uh, let's let's throw ourselves back to 1967 and 1969, and uh, it's Winterland, San Francisco, and it's the Ark in Boston, 1969. So, uh, uh, with my own personalization of it, it is my home city and my adopted city. So, um, always love a little little serendipity and magic sprinkled on every Grateful Dead situation. I always manage to find some, something. Uh, so there you go. There it is on this one. So let's uh, let's listen to that, and then we will come back and uh, chat some more, a few more stories, and a couple more songs. Cool.
listening to the the Isle Blues. I'm sure I just slaughtered that. And uh, but uh, yeah, I'm uh, I'm excited to listen to them back to back, and I hope everyone enjoyed. And uh, Wendy, you have so many stories again, like too many stories for one podcast. But um, you, we had talked a little bit about one, so uh, I want you to pull a couple out to share. Okay. Yeah. I mean, um, uh, well, I got two funny ones, but one interesting was so I was living in London for 20 years. You know, I was probably um, the only deadhead there, which was lonely and depressing because I was uh, basically all alone when Jerry died. Like Nobody gave a shit, which was sad. Um, and one day I was with some friends and I was making a mix. Um, I used to, you know, do my, I used to love making mixes. And I had just gotten Dozen at the Nick, the, I'm pretty, it was either a double or a triple CD from Albany 1990, which was a great, well, a great time for me. Again, it was freezing cold. I'm pretty sure I had no shoes on. I definitely didn't have a bra on, so fun for me. And um, I was shut out for definitely one of the nights. And it was a rough area, too. I remember that. It didn't feel safe. And um, so I'm, I'm having a peruse through the um, booklet that came with Dozen at the Nick. And all of a sudden, I see this picture. And I ask my friend that is sitting with me, I said, is that me in the picture? And there I was, you know, I'm surrounded by all these, like, perfect-looking deadhead girls, you know, holding up their, I need a miracle sign. And there I was in the background, look, freezing with my backpack and 18 sweaters, my backpack on my front, underneath my 18 sweaters, and, of course, enormous poncho, because you had to be wearing an enormous poncho. So I looked uh, about eight months pregnant and really unhappy. And I was just in hysteria. I'm looking at the picture right now because it's in a frame on my uh, bookcase. And to this day, it just cracks me up to no end because I found it in London. I had no clue. And I just, it, it just brought back every emotion of my friends being inside and me freezing, having like one apple to sustain me for six hours and no money and no way to get in. You know, but those were and the, and those were good times. Oh God, <laughs> I would do that tomorrow. Are you kidding me? If I could jack in my responsibilities and just hit the road, my big hit in the road is getting on a plane and going to Chicago or or Boston or something. You know, and that's fabulous. At least I know I'll be warm and I've got shoes on. But look, there's nothing like that. There is absolutely. I don't regret a moment of it. It was awesome, and and I'm documented in uh, in that. So. That that was uh, thrilling for me. So oh, very cool. Well, you're gonna you're gonna send me the picture for every podcast. I put a um, a thumbprint picture up, so uh, we oh, can put that up. If you, well, if we can, or we can choose something else for. Oh it. no, so, it's uh, so funny. I, I of course I'm gonna send it to you. I'll send it to you after this. Okay. Well, very cool. Well, so everyone who is listening, this is uh, we're gonna be able to. Uh, this isn't gonna just be an imagined uh, picture. This is gonna be the yeah. real shit. Yeah. Um, so we have a couple more songs. So that's uh, so the the first song that you and I talked about was "Death Have No Mercy," and you spoke very passionately about what that song does to you. So uh, tell me a bit about the version we picked and uh, why we picked it. Well, "Don't Have No Mercy" is one of my top five Grateful Dead tunes of all time, and it has no vocals, which is weird, but it has the most insane opening. Just the the second I hear that. Do, 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 which I'm not doing it any justice, but you can kind of get what I'm saying. It's just, it is like film noir. And I speak in film terms because I am putting that song in a movie if it kills me at some point. And uh, it, it, it's just, it's like a very passionate tune. It evokes a tremendous amount of emotion. It's dirty. It makes me, th- it, you know, although it's 1960s, it could feel like it, it. You could have put that in Taxi Driver. You know what I mean? Yeah. Dark. It's kind of wrong. It feels, you know, a little scandalous. And and the more the better for me. I love stuff like that. So the darker the better. And uh, you know that that tune I've been listening to at least three times a day for a couple of decades. I mean I've never not listened to that. You know, I used to play that in utero to my kid. And, um, you know, it's just, it just 
blows me away every time. I have never once, like it could just come on anywhere. I was in a, in a club once. I don't even know where I was. And I couldn't believe this song came on. And I bypassed the five million people that were at the club. And I went up to the DJ and I was like, my jaw was on the floor. He thought I was having a seizure. I was just so impressed. I couldn't believe that anybody would play this. And he and I became very good friends after that. Oh, that's awesome. Well, I'm sure everybody is salivating now, and uh, they want to they hear what you're feeling. So uh, uh, we picked, uh, we picked the, the Live Dead version, or you picked. You, of course, you, you picked the song. No, no. Did you pick the Live no. Dead? No, it's oh. just your first album studio version. It can't studio be live. Studio version. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Studio album, studio version. That's Sorry. that is. And again, listeners, we we just met on the phone a couple of hours ago. We were so excited to do this podcast about it. Is uh, we're uh, we are we're like down and dirty. Let's uh, let's meet, let's tape, and let's share like ASAP. Fish. So, um, so Fish. Fun. That's perfect, man. So very cool. All right, well, we're gonna play this, and then we got another story and one more tune. So. Uh, so uh, here we go.
well, back from listening to Death Have No Mercy, and uh, and there's another story. And I haven't heard this story yet. You uh, alluded to the story, and so I am hearing this for the first time, and uh, and uh, it involves Howard Stern. So uh, let's hear a little bit about that. So I had come back from uh, college. Well, I'm, yeah, I'm not pretty sure I was at um, living in Amherst, and I was back at my mom's in New Jersey. And Howard Stern is like a practically a relative. I've grown up listening to Howard Stern. I'm listening to Howard Stern five minutes before you called. Um, and um, so I'm listening on the radio, and he says he's giving away Grateful Dead tickets. And I'm in New Jersey. He's in New York City. Call up my cousin. I say, I'll give you 20 bucks. you got to get me to the city now. Because it was Giant Stadium. I'm pretty sure it was Steve Miller, who I absolutely fucking adore. And the dead. So, and I was getting ready to move um, soon or go back to Alaska, something like that. I knew I was leaving town soon. And um, so he picks me up. And, of course, I'm wearing a tube top because prior to having children, women can wear tube tops. And um, some kind of peasanty dress garb. So we get to New York City, there's huge traffic, and I'm listening to Howard Stern, and he's like, whoa, we've only got 20 minutes left, if you want to come down here, what are you going to do to get Grateful Dead tickets? And I'm like, oh, I can do whatever it takes. So hey, my cousin drops me off, and I, pro- I think I run like 20 blocks in a tube top, I'm not even sure if I had shoes on, and I'm running to get to, you know, this fancy New York City building where Howard Stern's recording. I get in, I just make it. Like um, Gary Baba Booey signs me in. I'm all shaky and weird. I'm in the I'm in the studio with him. <laughs> it's, it's so weird because they don't even look at you. So I'm standing there next to this porn person, blatantly hooker, and I'm like, "You like the Grateful Dead?" I'm like, you know, and it was supposed to be we got to show our boobs, and then you get the tickets. Now the, I am no, you know, I I'm not a, a porn person like a traditional Howard Stern female from back in the '80s. Something and there's no way I'm going to beat this girl. So I start buttering up Howard, giving compliments on prior shows and everything, and nobody looks at you. That's just the weirdest thing. You think they maintain eye contact. They don't even see you. And, um, you know, ultimately, it, sh- she looked like a hooker, and so she was going to get the tickets. And I just begged and pleaded, and he gave me tickets, too. So the show was either that night or the next day. And I used to make a lot of money selling tequila, buck a shot. So I used to have this apparatus that I used to wear across my body, and I would just pour out shots for a buck. And pretty much every person that I sold tequila to, kind of like we would start talking, and I would mention the Howard Stern show, and everybody there had heard that broadcast. And it was just hysterical. I mean, that shows the devotion to the hardcore that you would just like, run 25 blocks down through midtown Manhattan in a tube top and, you know, some kind of uh, Indian skirt with no shoes, pleading while a porn star is about to get your Grateful Dead tickets while you need those tickets more than her, you know, and uh, and I got them. And then you, I so made I'm my on the edge of my seat. Killer. I'm on the edge of my seat. Did you show your boobs for him? Of course I did. Come on. Of course you did. Okay, well, I figured as much. He's never going to be there. there. <laughs> Who wouldn't? <laughs> no, no. I mean, I want, you know, like I'm, I'm trying to visualize the whole thing. So, And did she go to the show too? Like, did you see her at the show? Did she? No, oh, I'm sure she probably that? sold it, you know, <laughs> to get her nails done or something. This this was not someone who was going to be running down 40 blocks in Midtown because no, Miller no, was no. You know, I mean, listen. No, I mean, we are everywhere. I'm sure there's porn stars that love the dead too. I mean, you know, it could. Mm, it, it, I'm gonna, it, I'm gonna <laughs> challenge that one. But you know, listen, it, this, this isn't a massive dig. But if it would have been Dylan in the dead, I don't know if I would have done that running. But because it was Steve Miller, I was gonna do whatever it took as well. Plus, it was the it was the comedy component of it. I mean, it's a great story to tell. One year, I was at the Cannes Film Festival, and Jackie the Joke Man was there. Right? He was at a party. I was on. I couldn't fucking believe it. Nobody recognized him. I'm like, holy shit! Jackie and I ended up becoming quite chummy. But I was like, would you possibly remember me showing up there to get Grateful Dead tickets? Of course, he has no memory, but. He hated the Grateful Dead anyway, but I just thought that that was the whole thing was hysterical. No, no, I mean, those are those are those are life memories that uh, that. 
tapestry of what's everything. You know, I mean, I I, I meet so many people in life who whose names will be not never revealed, but who just live these you know very mundane lives, and uh, and their lives are all about being nosy bodies on what everyone else is doing in their lives, and you just think like, but what's your story? You know, like you've got to have you've got to have those stories to be able to to think about as as we get older and to sustain us on you know you know the crazy shit we I continue to do I'll continue to do crazy shit for good stories because yeah nowhere near dead yet so I'm yeah not, uh, exactly and you know <laughs> your, your boobs are always a lot look we've had kids but your boobs are always a lot better prior to that so I didn't have any issues with that hence the tube top but you know it was it was awesome and uh, you know I would I would do it for uh, Hollywood Bowl tickets as well coming up this summer I, I i would do it if anybody wanted to see them i would do it so a uh, pit seats or pit tickets i mean it depends on where i get to be at the show but you know it's negotiable um, yeah yeah not not sure. for the stands <laughs> i wouldn't do it for the stands, definitely not uh, not for the stands but i mean it depends on where do i get to be at the show at this point now that i'm older of course the boobs aren't as good but you know i don't know but then again we're growing older with the set so you know i i find being in my 40s is actually kind of a sweet spot for like dudes in their 60s because they can kind of be like, eh, you know, like they, it's 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 young enough that it's young, but not so young that you're like their their granddaughter's age, you know. So totally, you, know, you, you make it work for you <laughs> any way you can. Well, let's go into some more music. Um, and actually, this is a uh, goes right in with a uh, having uh, having experiences though. I think it's a little dark of a song. It's not really an upbeat song. But the last song that we picked was. Uh, or you picked was uh, High Time. So tell me a little bit about um, this pick and, uh, and and why we're playing it. Yeah, I mean, you know, again, so hard to pick songs, but High Time, you know, Working Man's Dead will always remind me of the hardcore hippie days of living in Amherst, Massachusetts, and always going to New Hampshire and, and Vermont for shows and whatnot. But High Time is just one of those songs that just stops me dead. You know, it just stops me. You got it. It just makes you sing every word. It makes me cry. For some reason, I always imagine I'm harmonizing really well with them, even though I'm not at all capable of physically harmonizing with them. But they, it sounds so good, and the production is so amazing. It, it, it's just a visual song. It's just Jerry, my. God, it's so fucking emotional, and it it hurts, you know. Yeah, Cup, those yeah. songs just hurt, and that album is it's you know I I've yet to find anyone who ever said God that album sucks like that. I would struggle if I ever met anyone that did say that, but that that's my that's my jam off that album, and it's right, not much uh, of a jam. It's a bit of a I got to slow down here and sit down and take it in. Yeah, that's what I say. It's it's it's, it's not a fun song, but it's a but it's a it's a soulful song. You know, it's a song that again, yeah, your your heart just kind of opens up to, and uh, while you're singing it, it's a wailing song, right? You yeah. Know, it's a it's a. I mean, I'm a big dog lover. It kind of imagines, you know, like the the wailing, the the dog, like you know what I mean, the howling all together that goes into that song is kind it's of the, painful. The you can feel the pain. And, you know, I, I, would, I don't want to ever imagine Jerry's pain. We all have pain, but it's, it's really out there, and it, and it hurt. But it, it's the production as well. It's unbelievably well produced, and it, it's just, it's, a, it's perfect. Well, I am going to play this perfect production of High Time, and then we are going to come back. And this is from Working Instead, of course. And then we're going to come back, and we're going to say goodbye and, uh, and uh, enjoy. Okay. You told me goodbye How was I to know You didn't mean goodbye You meant
so much fun and and we're going to meet next month when I'm in New York most definitely for sure most definitely so well thank you so much for coming and sharing a couple of stories and uh and yeah we'll meet in New York and then there's all this fun shit going on this summer so I'm sure it'll be the first of of many and uh thank you for oh listen for- it's been my pleasure and thank you for your efforts with doing this i think it's fabulous i think it's great do you know expansion of community is just beautiful and you know i can talk about the grateful dead all day every day so thank you for doing this uh well i'm having the best time and um I don't know. Having the best time, and uh, that's 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 everything. So, well, sure. thank you everyone for tuning in, and uh, and 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 we'll be back next week. Bye. Bye. See ya.